welcome to our I start again. Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's IWFM uh, episode entitled How to Create a Future Facing Workplace. Uh, today's episode is in partnership with Millenol, and we have a stellar speaker from Millenol that you can see on our screens there. We will quickly go into the introductions shortly. But basically, this is building on a roundtable debate we had about uh, future facing workplace and some of the challenges around design and other issues that Joseph will go be going through today today. So if we just do some introductions just for the audience, as I've mentioned Joseph's name already, um, I start with myself, Peter Brogan, Head of Research and Insight here at the IWFM. Many of you listener viewers would have seen me on previous episodes of our NTT series. So I'd be hosting today, taking you through the Q&A section that we have got today in terms of uh, today's episode. Um, but as you can see on your screens there and a lovely picture there of Joseph White, Director of Design Strategy, Miller no, I'd like to just introduce, uh, well, Joseph to introduce himself to the audience. So where you're situated, it's good morning, Joseph, but good afternoon for most of our viewers. Yes, good afternoon to everyone. Um, I'm in Buffalo, New York, um, joining you here for this call. Um, so my background is in the design of physical places, um, mostly corporate workplace. And at Miller Knoll, my role is really focused on advancing our understanding of the relationship between people and the places that we create. So that means pulling forward our legacy of research that spans back over decades, but also looking forward into the future to learn more about that relationship over time. No, and thank you and good morning to you, Joseph. So no, thank you for that introduction. So hopefully viewer listeners, you've got an idea of who you'll be listening from mainly today. Joseph will be going through the report. And if we go just go to the next slide. This is the report there. So this is currently available. This was recently launched in terms of the round table debate about future office design. And there's a QR code there with, with, with in partnership with Miller and I was mentioned before, but the, the report and today's episode does really dive into the, the main topics within uh, this area really. So it's considerations around office design, the clues on the title there, but also at other areas that you're probably grappling now and possibly in the future in terms of tech technology, workplace policies, inclusivity and well-being and the legal landscape. So some of that certainly Joseph will be going through today. As I've already mentioned, uh, we do have a QA and a section on today's episode, but so please send your questions through the Q&A function for Joseph and myself to take later on. This episode is being recorded, so um, please, please um Please note this will be shortly on our website so you can cascade to clients and colleagues that couldn't make today's live episode. So we tried to make it as short on the introductions as possible. would encourage you to have a look at the report, but you're getting some insight from one of the stellar panelists and someone from Miller and Noel today just to give you some insight around what was coming out of that report. So at this point, I'm going to hand back to Joseph and I will see you at the Q&A. So Joseph, I hand back to your dear self. Thank you very much, Peter. Um, okay, so I'm going to, as Peter was saying, run through some of the high level current issues that were surfaced during our panel discussion. Um, and these were issues that um, a broad range of organizations were considering relative to next steps in planning their future approach to workplace. Uh, along the way, I will pose some quick and anonymous polling questions so that you can assess where you are in your organization relative to the broader group that's on the call. Um, just a quick pulse check. Um, and then lastly, I'll close with um, some key takeaways and some time uh, for Q&A uh, from you based on Miller Knowles' uh, experience uh, helping many different organizations plan their near and long-term approaches to the workplace. One last thing that I will say um, regarding the download here, um, I'm going to touch on several um, guidance points. There are links to additional resources in that report that you can find to a, a broad range of things where you can go for, for further information. Okay. So the roundtable participants, um, we wanted to make sure that we were pulling together a broad range of, of folks because we wanted to get um, a really well-rounded perspective. And we heard firsthand experiences about what's working, um, challenges yet to be overcome, and the different ways that organizations are charting their course into the future. 
Um, several folks mentioned that there were small signals that were sent uh, in their organization, either through things that were said, uh, messages that were sent, or even um, the way that the physical environment itself was configured could send a really strong message for better or worse. Um, and that many uh, admitted that there had been a significant change in mindset over the last couple of years around how they approached work, workplace, and even their, their broader um, staff of workers. Um, even though there are still a lot of unanswered questions within all of this, uh, all of the panel was um, pretty, uh, uh, pretty stuck in, I believe they say, uh, in your part of the world, um, to figuring this out, working together, experimenting, collaborating, sharing learnings, um, seeing this as a real opportunity to, to do something better. Um, so the participants themselves, we had Anne O'Farrow, who uh, manages the workplace program at Red Hat, Elaine Assal, who is a senior associate at Gensler, focused specifically on um, workplace strategy um, and design strategy more broadly. Jennifer Kolstad, who's the global design and brand director for Ford uh, Motor Company. Um, this is looking at the design of their facilities, as well as looking into retail spaces and um, how that company engages with the world through their built environment. Uh, Patrick O'Farrell, who heads facilities management uh, with Nationwide. Um, per Henson, who is the uh, global head of smart working for Credit Suisse. Uh, and last but certainly not least, Zoe, Sumper Zoe Humphreys, who's the workplace experience director for the real estate organization Cushman and Wakefield. So across the panel, these were the, the four high level areas that we, we dove into and the ones that I'll be pulling out highlights and guidance points uh, for you today on the call. Uh, the first one, looking at office design, so the design of the physical environment, um, and how that is relating to a more personalized work experience, looking at um, different individual preferences um, and how that's uh, showing up in the design of the built environment. The second issue was looking at hybrid working and technology and how that's leading to an expanding and evolving ecosystem of work support. The third issue was looking at inclusive design and well-being. Um, I would say of all of the issues, this is the one that um, uh, I would say there's the greatest opportunity for progress um, in terms of um, what can be done and changes that organizations can be made. But nonetheless, there were some interesting insights that were raised by the panelists on this point. And then the fourth, um, looking at the path forward, um, acknowledging some emerging legal issues, um, and also acknowledging that this is a, a very, um, very, very varied landscape across the globe, um, looking at different uh, considerations that are that are coming forward. Uh, another acknowledgement that I would make here is these are, of course, by no means all of the current considerations. These were just the ones that were top of mind uh, during this panel discussion with those specific folks that we just that I just shared on the previous screen. Okay, uh, without further ado, let's dive in. So the first issue that we focused on is looking at office design and the personalized work experience. Um, right out of the gate, many of the panelists acknowledged that many organizations, uh, and this in particular was coming from uh, Elaine Assal, who uh, working with Gensler, a very large architecture firm, has had uh, many interactions with organizations around the globe. And many of their clients, um, she was saying, have stopped trying to predict the future and its implications for the office design in general. So this was really um, looking at uh, the world outside, if you will. Um, and a phrase that I like to use is um, trying to predict the shape of the box of the future that you're going to put people in. Um, and instead, organizations have really started to look inward um, and do some, um, some serious introspection on their own culture um, and figuring out what makes them tick, what makes them unique. Um, and that inward look was starting to reveal that this, the future state, if you will, is relative to each organization's current state. So what we might identify as future may indeed be one organization's recent past. Um, and that's, that's all fine. Um, the most important thing is for you to assess where you are today and where you want to go next um, and start putting in place a plan to make that progress. 
Um, these next two points were something that um, were very top of mind uh, for many of the panelists, and it was uh, this focus on balancing tensions, um, balancing uh, the difference between short-term needs and long-term vision. So there are, of course, um, some critical issues that need to be addressed first and foremost in the moment, but then also those longer-term aspirations for um, a vision that you see for your organization and the type of workplace that you want to support. The next tension that was looked at was really trying to understand how do you balance individual needs and desires against organizational or you know, business objectives? Um, this was something that was was really key, and a, a good insight here was that um, many organizations can be reluctant to ask people um, what they want um, for fear of opening the floodgates and not being able to to hold back the requests. Um, but a, a really great idea that was that was mentioned was to refocus the conversation on the origin point of the relationship between the worker and the employer. So in that moment when an employer posted a job opening and said, uh, we need someone to fill this task, and that worker raised their hand and said, hire me, I can do that better than anyone else. Focusing the conversation on desires and needs relative to what is necessary to be successful in that job function, first and foremost. Other things that are outside of that are, of course, important as well, but um, the guidance was to acknowledge those, put them on the table, look first and foremost around what was necessary to be successful in the job, um, and then layer on those additional considerations after that. Within all of this, um, it can seem uh, fairly daunting to uh, address personalization um, and uh, increasing variety within an organization's workplace and design, but team the team level seems to be the most feasible um, level to target when it, uh, designing for new modes of engagement and personalization in the workplace. And so what that means is um, if you look across different functional teams or groups within your organization, empowering them to come together and develop a, a new agreement on how they're going to support each other, how they're going to show up, when they're going to show up, what sort of tools and spaces they might use in order to complete their work, and how that might evolve over time. Um, so we've seen some organizations put some structure to this, come up with, you know, say three to five questions that they want all of their teams to answer um, about how they're going to work together in this, this new uh, moment that we find ourselves in. And then collecting those team level working agreements back uh, almost as a, a new data source to use in planning future um, uh, approaches to workplace. Another way that we're seeing those team level working agreements, um, and I'll touch on this a little bit later in the talk, is to um, start to look strategically at when certain teams might be coming into the office, because we're starting to see some teams um, are only wanting to get together once a month, some only once a quarter, some want to get together every week. Um, but looking at that and getting a sense of what sort of cadence people want to be um, showing up within, and then um, strategically planning for opportunistic um, times for teams to be in the same place at the same time uh, and be able to share information in that way. There was another acknowledgement here around the rapid evolution of of tools for work, processes for getting things done, and that is driving a need for experimentation and collaboration across groups. So even within those team level working agreements, being able to identify new types of tools and processes that teams are experimenting with and sharing those learnings across the organization. Um, so this starts to lead to um, creating pathways for different teams to get things done in different ways. Uh, in, uh, a manner that respects the unique ways that they work. So some guidance points on this issue of office design and the personalized work experience. Um, the first and foremost uh, thing to do is to engage your people, whether that's via surveys or focus groups, in order to establish the, the most immediate needs and what matters most to them in their work experience. An important thing to consider here is to only ask about as much as you're prepared to act on. You may want to ask 100 questions about the work experience, but if you only have the budget, the schedule, the uh, the person power to act on three of those questions, 
it's best just to ask those three questions and say that another survey will be coming soon to address the next pieces. If you ask for too much feedback and you don't act on it, then that actually starts to damage your ability to collect more feedback going into the future. So starting small, asking for small engagement, making adjustments, more small engagement, more adjustments, that actually goes a long way in order to help strengthen um, trust and engagement uh, in dialogue with people about their work experience. Um, as I mentioned, empower teams to draft team level working agreements. And then this third one here, establishing guiding principles to, um, to help balance long-term aspirations and short-term needs. And this is something that's really best done with senior leadership within the organization um, and to establish um, principles around you know, flexibility, well-being, what sort of things do you want to make sure are, are good and true across your organization? This also creates a pathway to allow um, very different types of teams to have equitable experience. So for instance, um, uh, on the panel, we had some folks that had uh, a clear office staff, you know, that were desk based, and then they had other workers that were on a factory floor in a very, very different environment, but establishing principles along the lines of, you know, making sure that all workers have access to daylight or um, healthy snacks throughout the day, um, or schedule flexibility, for instance, and that would show up differently in those different types of environments, but those principles help create um, some equity of experience across the organization. The last guidance point here is um, small, but quite impactful. And this is really around shaping the dialogue within your organization uh, with your executive leadership, as well as your broader workforce around aiming for progress over perfection. This is not something that we're gonna solve immediately. It's gonna take quite some time um, to incrementally build improvements day by day. Uh, and in doing so, we create a more uh, sustainable path forward. And as I was mentioning earlier, drive more engagement uh, with workers in organizations. Okay, Annie, if you will please open the first audience poll, we'll leave this open for a couple moments. Um, but what we want to ask is, has your organization engaged your people to assess recent changes in their work experience? Um, just want to get a quick quick um, pulse check here. Um, and these are anonymous questions. So answer truthfully. We'll leave this open for uh, just a couple more seconds to get some responses. And this is, uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, you know, organizations have started to shift away from looking for external benchmarks, but it is still kind of nice to know to get a sense of where you're sitting relative to other folks. Okay, go ahead and close the poll. All right. Oh, this is great. So we, as you can see on the screen, we have uh, a majority of folks, a little over half have collected input. Um, some are planning to engage people very soon, and we've got some others who are not collecting input at this time. Um, really encourage you to, to think about a way that you might be able to do that that makes sense within your organization. Okay, moving on. So the second issue, hybrid working and technology and evolving experience. So the highlights here. Um, you know, for this, uh, many of the, the the shifts and changes that we've experienced over the last couple of years really began before the pandemic, but the pandemic pushed this widespread adoption of distributed work as a necessity. It was really a triage measure to help keep organizations going, um, but it has led to deeply held expectations for flexibility, both in when work happens and where work happens. Um, and so in that moment, Many organizations said to their people, you're not in the office, we trust you to be productive and keep our organization alive during this uncertain time. Now, many organizations have said, essentially, they haven't said this literally, but we don't trust you anymore, come back into the office. So this is where, uh, when I mentioned earlier that small signals can send big messages, that's a big example of one. So now we need to find ways to work within those expectations of flexibility um, and bring on some of those new technology tools, new working processes, and think about how they're changing the shape of the, the office. 
And that that expectation for flexibility has really become a flashpoint in attracting and retaining talent across regions. Um, several panelists mentioned that they had started recruiting beyond um, global regions where they had traditionally in the past, opening up broader talent pools and access to folks that they weren't reaching previously. But not everyone was in agreement on this. Um, uh, some folks on the panel had some pretty stringent rules looking at um, tax implications and legal implications around hiring folks from different global regions. And so they did actually have a requirement that people work within a local region from one of their facilities. And that was uh, from a, a legal and tax standpoint. Um, the increased adoption of digital technology tools, things like Slack, Microsoft Teams, um, using asynchronous communication and video, um, uh, along with those increased expectations for flexibility are impacting office designs. Um, one of the things that we're seeing here is that um, individual one-to-one -one desks that have been the majority of floor area in many offices around the globe, that floor area is starting to um, shrink a bit and in some cases be replaced with more collaborative environments to support either longer term um, team collaborative sessions or more social interactions. Um, a, a rule of thumb that we've started to see emerge is shifting from almost 80% of the floor plate being allocated to individual desks and chairs and 20% uh, desk and chairs that were largely owned um, or assigned uh, and 20% of the area being shared group collaboration spaces, that that's almost flipping entirely with nearly 80% of the floor area being allocated to group spaces, uh, spaces for collaboration, socialization, et cetera, and about 20% of the floor area being dedicated to spaces for individuals, and many of those spaces being shared um, free address or hoteling type spaces. Um, there's a, a new focus on the interface between physical and digital environments across an expanding workplace ecosystem. So I mentioned um, uh, platforms like Microsoft Teams earlier actually creating a digital space for teams to exist so that there is access to information regardless of where people may be, whether they're working from home, the office, or some other facility. Um, and that really starts to become part of the, the quote unquote workplace and part of what enables that flexibility and choice. And within that, with that expansion of the workplace ecosystem comes a shift in focus of really thinking first and foremost about the workplace to thinking more about the work experience and finding new ways to measure it. So that point that was mentioned earlier around engaging people in dialogue about their work experience is uh, a key step that many organizations are taking, not only to understand short-term needs, but to start to collect data on um, satisfaction with experience itself and how that can be measured over time, using it as a benchmark, if you will. So establishing internal benchmarks as opposed to looking for external benchmarks. It was also acknowledged that while we've got lots of uh, amazing new digital technology tools, there is a gap in being able to uh, pull together or aggregate data from many different sources and start to lead into more predictive tools that can provide better guidance on needs for things like quantity of space, um, scheduling, things along those lines. Um, and this is something that uh, as an industry, we're really at the very beginning stages of, of how do we pull all the data that we have access together to, um, um, to inform our, our workplace planning and start to use that in a more predictive manner. So some guidance points here on this, on this topic. Um, it's really important for each organization to assess within their context, the best support for working from home versus the office and elsewhere. One of the panelists mentioned that um, all that there, many of their associates had very high quality um, monitors in their home work environments, high resolution, larger format, things along those lines but that the monitors that they provided in the workplace were a little more um, generic, you know, where the individual workers had really specialized the monitors to their needs at home. The ones in the office um, were, were more general and not quite as specialized. So in that instance, when it came to doing um, screen intensive work, 
um, the home was really providing the best support. And so they looked at um, tweaking their workplace as a counter to provide something that the home couldn't provide. That likely looks very different in your organization, um, but it's important to assess across that uh, expanding ecosystem of work where the bright spots are, where are, where's the best support for certain tasks, and how can you tune the other parts of the ecosystem to provide um, uh, a counterbalance. Um, there was a notion of looking at planning long term for flexible solutions, and that means um, looking at multiple scales and rates of change. So looking at what's happening at the individual experience, the team experience, and the organization at large, as well as both short and long term change. Um, so this is something where um, organizations are building really robust transition plans around how to uh, make some small and immediate changes leading to larger changes leading to really a full scale um, uh, new vision for the workplace further down the road. Uh, the last um, guidance point here on this issue is to really aim to build trust and new muscle memory for organization change through implementing short-term pilot projects. And so, um, again, to touch back on that idea of team-based working agreements, you may see an opportunity for the development of a new type of team collaborative space. Um, if you collect feedback from those agreements and build a, a pilot project around testing one of those and making it clear that it's a it's a test, it's a short term pilot. Uh, many of the folks on the panel acknowledged that they saw that their workforce was much more willing to accept change if it's introduced in smaller doses and being acknowledged as something that's temporary that you're going to learn from. You will implement what works well and you'll refine what doesn't and continue forward with another um, short term test. OK, now it's time for the second polling question. If you'll open that poll, please, Annie. So uh, over the past two years, has your organi organization introduced new settings to support new ways of working together, either be it at home or in the office? Um, so think about if there have been any types of new environments that uh, didn't exist prior to the previous two years. Uh, let us know what you think on that one. We'll keep this open for just another uh, few seconds to uh, give some folks a chance to respond. Okay, you can go ahead and close the poll. This is great. Wow, look at this. 83% of you have introduced new settings. So within this, there's a tremendous amount of learnings. Um, I would be curious to hear more in the in the Q&A session around what's worked, what hasn't worked, um, and how this has implemented your plans going forward. Okay, moving on. Issue number three. Uh, inclusive design and well-being. So everyone agreed that worker well-being is important and something that they wanted to focus on, but acknowledged that progress in these initiatives is limited if they aren't aligned with business needs and executive endorsement. That was really key. Um, and this is something where um, there can be uh, an unintentional disconnect around um, uh, sending out messages, talking about how inclusive an organization is, how accessible their spaces are. But if the environment doesn't reflect that, um, then again, that's going to create um, issues of trust in that disconnect. So if you are introducing well-being spaces, spaces for individuals to take care of their, their own mental well-being, to step away from work, to recharge, that it's important for executives to not only endorse, but also um, model the way, if you will, show folks that it is uh, okay and desirable to actually engage with those types of services. Uh, the panelists acknowledged that culture is indeed the heart of every organization um, and that it's a living thing and requires near constant attention and should be considered for any new decision in planning for future workplace design. Um, we spent a fair amount of time talking about social bonds and how they've changed over the course of the pandemic. Um, many acknowledged, and there is actually um, data to back this up, 
that bonds with immediate teams, with immediate managers, were actually strengthened over the course of the pandemic. And a lot of that was through um, the huge increase in video connections, um, those tiny little video tiles that you see on your team meetings, getting to catch glimpses into people's personal lives, um, seeing their pets, their kids, the art on their walls, learning a little bit more about what makes them tick as a person. Um, that is something that was actually a really good thing. But um, bonds across teams were often stretched thin um, across the organization at large. And this is a risky factor because those, those bonds, those weak ties, as social, sociologists refer to them, are actually what's key for moving knowledge across an organization and how innovation often happens. So paying more attention to ensuring those connections from team to team are not being stretched uh, beyond their limits. Another point here, thinking back to that Zoom meeting where everyone has a video tile on the screen and you're seeing a little bit of each person's identity. Um, there was an insight here around how that could be a proxy for how we could see um, variation and personalization starting to show up in the workplace a little bit differently. Um, in organizations where desks were assigned one person to one desk, in many cases, that desk represented um, identity for them. That was their personal stake in that place. And I think we would all agree that a desk and a chair is a pretty poor proxy for identity in the first place. But how could we start to bring some of that flavor and variety of, of different folks into an environment? When you have a team space, how can you get a sense of, of who's actually um, making up that team and what makes one different from another? Um, lastly, there was an acknowledgement here that place is the stage where your culture plays out, and it sends a really visceral message, be it positive or negative. So another example might be uh, if an organization touts itself as uh, being very inclusive, very collaborative, yet you go into their environment and you see wide open areas of individual desks and chairs that all look the same. Um, that physical environment is not really sending a signal of being inclusive or collaborative in that instance. And so there's a bit of a disconnect. So making sure that the messages that you're sending, not just through email and broader company communications, but also how your physical place is designed are in tight alignment. So when we look at the guidance checklist for this topic area, um, it's important to create spaces that strengthen community ties and help people connect with the purpose of your organization. And so when we talk about community spaces, that really means looking at spaces that are intended to support those team to team connections, where people from one team can casually connect with folks from another team. Um, and those spaces being special and different than dedicated team collaboration spaces. Those are in, these are environments that can be really good to have cultural artifacts or some sort of indicator of the purpose of the organization to allow different folks to form their own personal relationship to it. Um, the next one was around focusing a culture of belonging and encourage executives to walk the talk. There's a great link in the, the guidance checklist in the downloaded report here um, to a brilliant thinker. Uh, his name is John A. Powell, and he's got a lot of great things to say about belonging, but he defines belonging as um, the state when only those who belong can decide who belongs and what needs will be met by the community. So this is a really key thing back again to engaging people in dialogue about the work experience and really um, elevating that dialogue across the whole organization. Um, lastly, there was an acknowledgement that there are um, uh, several existing frameworks and certifications that are out there relative to well-being, um, and that those can be really useful to provide guidance if the path forward isn't clear. Um, but some caution was also um, expressed around looking at those certifications um, fully and making sure that you have executive buy-in and support, uh, because in some instances they could start to push an organization into a, a direction that they may not be ready to go just yet. But regardless, these can provide um, uh, information to inform your own strategy if there are certain initiatives that you want to place on your long-term goals um, to begin socializing those within your organization. Okay, this is our, our third poll. So if you'll open that for the audience, please, Annie. 
So over the past two years, has your organization made changes either in policy or place design to support inclusion and well-being? Um, just want to try to get a sense of if you've made some changes, um, if you're evaluating changes for the future or you're not making changes at this time. And we'll leave this open for just a few more seconds to give folks a chance to respond. Okay, you should go ahead and close the poll. We'll see where see where things stack up. Excellent. Um, we've got lots of positive change moving forward here. Um, very few folks saying that they aren't making changes. Um, and then some that are evaluating potential future changes. So again, when we get to the q and A, I would be curious to hear a little bit about your experience in terms of what's worked, what hasn't worked, um, and share some of those thoughts with the group. Okay. Here we are at our final um, issue area, um, looking at the path forward and the legal landscape. So it was acknowledged straight out of the gate on this point that when people are working from home, the duty of care of the organization doesn't stop. And this poses a significant challenge for organizations. Uh, Zoe Humphreys in particular uh, from Cushman and Wakefield said that this can start to get into all sorts of areas, even looking at things like quality of sleep. If someone's not getting high quality of sleep, then their work is going to be impacted. But does an organization really want to be monitoring the sleep patterns of their workers? Most likely not. Um, so this is something where uh, we're really starting to move into some unfamiliar territory with that idea of that expanding ecosystem of work. And this is where um, it starts to become really critical for uh, worker service teams within an organization, looking at HR, IT, uh, facilities, as well as business leaders to start coming together um, in light of those long-term guiding principles and establish some new um, uh, objectives on this point and just make it really clear where the organization uh, stands and be transparent with uh, the workforce around what sort of support they can expect um, and how that uh, relationship may evolve over time. One of the key things here was looking at freedom of choice and the acknowledgement that that will always provide more satisfaction than any support package for remote work. And that folks who aren't satisfied with the level of flexibility that they're given um, within their organization are really starting to vote with their feet. Um, this is something where um, I believe in the guidance checklist in the report, there's an organization called Future Forum uh, that Miller Knoll is a founding partner of. And um, one of the primary drivers there is a quarterly pulse survey of between 10 and 11,000 knowledge workers across six different uh, countries. Um, and some of the data within those reports are showing that um, folks can be up to, um, uh, so I'll just not remembering the specific number, but they are significantly more likely to be looking for another job uh, if they're not satisfied with the flexibility they're given. Choice is another key part in this. Flexibility without choice um, is actually a really detrimental combination. Um, because if you're saying, yes, you can work anywhere, but you only have one option, then that flexibility isn't really um, uh, maximizing on its potential. So you have to consider the flexibility and the variety of choice hand in hand in order to get the maximum benefit. Um, and again, on this point of this shift in thinking or the realization of moving to focus more on workplace worker experience, and then acknowledging that the place design follows in support. So the place should always be moving just behind uh, where folks are wanting to be. And um, over time, as we get better and better at managing that dialogue between what it is that workers are seeking to do and how they seek to do it and how the environment responds, that the lag diminishes and you want it to be as close as possible, but making sure that the, the workplace is there as a support to people. And what we found uh, across the panel was that in um, within their organizations, increased collaboration across functions like HR, IT, facilities, and business leaders, and elevating the awareness across those groups of the impact that the physical environment has not only on the objectives of their department, but also the broader business performance. So folks within place design and facilities 
um, actually are in a, a really prime seat when it comes to being able to lead conversations around making impact to the business. Uh, but in order to maximize that potential, you really have to kind of pull those perspectives together and look for common objectives. Um, the last highlight that I wanted to, to focus on here was that um, organizations are starting to see new roles emerging, either as uh, workplace host or community managers, and oftentimes current admin staff were evolving into those roles to be able to address a broad range of worker needs. This could be uh, an issue with the facility, finding a certain kind of room, um, or with a software tool, or even looking at um, helping to plan a, a team event, uh, for instance. But one of the key requirements for one of these community manager or workplace host roles would be having a strong uh, level of understanding across the functions mentioned in the point up above around HR, IT, facilities. So it's really a cross-functional expertise that organizations are looking for to fill this type of uh, um, this type of function. So for some guidance here, um, really reinforcing this point on partnering across teams to establish common objectives for the worker experience. Those high level principles that were mentioned earlier can be an excellent guide here around establishing those principles with executive leadership and then determining what that means for HR policy, for the types of IT tools that might be implemented, or what sort of legal implications might be triggered uh, as a result of those. Um, offering flexibility in cho and choice in worker schedule and location. Um, this is quickly becoming a, a non-negotiable um, across the board uh, and across the globe. Uh, and then lastly, consider establishing a workplace host role to help guide change and improve worker experience on a regular basis. Okay, here we go for our fourth and final polling question. Thank you for opening that up. Um, so when it comes to shaping worker experience in your organization, how collaborative are functions like HR, IT, facilities, legal and business leadership? Uh, would you say that you're working well together on common objectives? Um, you're actively working to increase collaboration? Maybe that's something that you haven't done much of in the past, but over the last couple of years, you've seen a significant increase in that. Or are those functionings operating independently in your in your current reality and for the the foreseeable future I'll leave this open for just a few more seconds to get a sense of where we're all standing as a collective group on this call okay go ahead and close the poll all right much more of a an even spread here but what i see is the leading indicator is that many organizations are working to increase their collaboration and that's a great thing i will say from my own experience of the broader experience of um, uh, miller knoll and our contacts uh, from many different organizations we've seen much more partnership from hr in particular uh, and in fact that future form uh, group that i mentioned earlier the vast majority of participants within that are HR leaders. Um, so chief human resources officers, folks along those lines. That's where we're seeing um, a lot of the greatest potential for partnership in moving forward in these types of initiatives. Okay, so now I'm gonna close things out with some key takeaways and then we'll move on to uh, your questions. Um, so most organizations are really feeling that it's too soon to have a complete definition of what their post-pandemic work experience is, um, but acknowledge that they're moving into a, a new mindset around experimentation and collaboration, not only within their organization, but also looking to partner organizations and figuring things out together. Uh, that future forum group that I mentioned um, was co-founded by Miller Knoll, Boston Consulting Group, Slack and a group called Management Leadership for Tomorrow, uh, which focuses on diversity, equity, and belonging, um, particularly with an interest in increasing the representation of underrepresented groups within uh, senior leadership structures. But that was that group was intentionally built as a cross-functional consortium so that we could learn from each other's perspectives um, in terms of uh, shaping the kind of future that we want. 
Um, flexibility and choice have become essential for workers, and they can feel a strong sense of resentment if that choice is now restricted um, when it was implemented so quickly during the pandemic. Um, and then these last two points are really key for uh, next steps and long-term vision. Um, so really starting to engage your people in a regular cadence, not having this just be a once and done survey, but having an ongoing dialogue to inform incremental adjustments in place um, as being a real benefit to building trust. And then lastly, establishing guiding principles to shape long-term visions uh, for your organization's workplace and doing that in partnership with business leaders, executive leadership, to make sure that there can be ways to uh, support those principles in the design of your place that makes a measurable impact on your business. Okay, with there, I think that leaves us with about uh, 15 minutes or so, 10 or 15 minutes to dive into some Q&A. So Peter, I will ask you to rejoin and moderate that session, please. No, thank you, Joseph, and thank you for taking us through that journey of, of the document that was mentioned earlier and available on the website of those four areas. So you were pleased to know we have had a load of questions through, and I would encourage uh, viewers, listeners to continue sending questions through as we go through that. But um, I think this uh, centred around probably the element where you talked about technology, and I appreciate this is coming from from one of the uh, live listener viewers today around a particular organization that's a bit risk averse. You probably met them many times. Um, and in terms of is the actual direct question is, how can you engage with stakeholders to make technological changes? And would you have a playbook for proving proof of concept staff retention against cost of procurement and yearly subscription to such services? There is no clear R and I. So to just, uh, target that directly Joseph I think it's the um combating the actual idea around persuasion around the joy of technological changes so I don't know from from your expertise and work with clients how has how has that been um defined within businesses to really show not necessarily the return on investment in financial terms but I would argue the fact of return on employee how has that boosted productivity but also some of the uh well-being concepts about staff retention and also well-being that you touched upon today so yes there's a financial factor here but surely there's a people focus as well so i don't know if there's any experience you had how how people have overcome those challenges yeah for sure and this was actually something that was raised in the panel discussion itself where um uh, and I, I don't recall which panelist said this exactly, but they, they acknowledge that one of the biggest mistakes that an organization can make in this moment is thinking that an app is going to solve everything. Um, and that, oh, we can come up with this, you know, employee experience app or this piece or that piece, this, to this tool, and the newness of that will just drive people into a new direction, a new state of mind. Um, that is a, a quick way to waste not only a lot of money, but also, I would say, uh, emotional capital with your people. Um, there are amazing new technology tools out there, but if they're not implemented strategically, um, then it can backfire. Because when you introduce new technology tools, you're essentially changing the way work happens. And that creates additional cognitive load for your employees. If they have to learn a new software tool, learn how it works, they still have to get their work done on a regular basis. So it's essentially adding to their workload. That leads to a lot of that um, aversion to change in a lot of cases. So you have to make the give get really clear. Um, and so that means doing a lot of advanced planning around understanding if implementing a new digital technology solution is going to save time. Um, what's the benefit? You know, are you providing additional time for ramp up, learning the new tool, experimenting? Are you providing guidance? Those sorts of things really need to be part of making those introductions. And another suggestion that I would say here is to, um, again, start small, uh, make small improvements, uh, uh, that notion of aiming for progress over perfection. And over time, as you build new muscle memory around change, people become more and more willing to accept more of it. And um, also use pilots to your, to your advantage. Find small user groups 
to test and provide feedback. And then you can use their experience to share more broadly with the organization when they find means of success and even find folks that can be ambassadors for that change within the organization. If they've implemented a new tool and found a benefit in it, having them share their stories for others. But it's really key to make sure that the business case is really clear up front um, around how it's going to make impact. And I would say that that's true for any change that you want to implement before putting it in place, have an idea of how you're going to measure its success, whether that's feedback from employees, measuring on time to completion, or any number of other things. Make sure that you define what success will look like before implementing that solution. No, I like that, Joseph, in terms of actually progress over perfection. There's probably a debate there. Is there ever such a thing as perfection? But uh, and that's one of my questions not to be answered today, but food for thought <laughs> about those steps as well as actually doing progress. And you're right, technology isn't isn't the silver bullet to all of this. I think that has to be at the forefront of people's minds. Just tying in with a question that's come in around measurement and followed up nicely with some of your closing remarks on that last question was... Around the well-being, you start the presentation today saying that this is one area where, where progress is um, still evolving and, and still needs to be developed for many people as uh, we adapt or pivot to, to a post-COVID world. But with individuals' well-being in mind, has there been any real data collected to gauge the impact of the need to use digital platforms due to the pandemic instead of physical in-person interaction? So is there any evidence out there to show, I guess, that that real, the, the level of impact? So is there anything that, and that question is kind of coming from a listener viewer. Um, thank you for that question. Um, so some of the things that come to mind for me are are the, the data on strength of relationships around feeling a connection to your immediate team, your immediate working manager versus the, the broader culture and purpose of the organization. Um, that's something that's key. Um, another is when asking um, uh, workers around what what would motivate them to come into the office when they go into an office, what motivates them. And uh, far and away, the highest response on that is around um, collaboration, camaraderie, social connection. Those are the things that people are craving. Um, video is great. It gives us a lot of flexibility to care for members of our family, to do things other um, in our lives in combination with our work. But we do miss our colleagues. We miss seeing them in person face to face. And so there's a lot of data that indicates that as a preference for people. And if the, the office environment doesn't provide appropriate space for that to happen, that can cause a bit of a disconnect. Um, I have seen some other data sources out there around um, uh, over-reliance on digital technology tools. Too much time on video um, can actually be quite draining and exhausting um, versus um, having a, a quick in-person chat. Um, and it can also be a barrier to communication. So for instance, if you think about being in a physical office, and passing by uh, someone who you know who's on another team and it sparks an idea in your mind that you want to share with them, there's very little resistance to saying, hey, I just thought about this, this idea that you might find interesting. That spark may occur to you when you're at home working on your computer, but what are the chances are that you're going to set up a video conference or type a message or send a call or make a call to share that same idea? So there is um, a, a belief around this that um, over-reliance on digital technology tools and not also in-person interaction can reduce the flow of information in an organization. I'm going to jump in with this question that I found interesting because I've jumped in it, possibly because my my, my uh, elder sister's an art teacher. But this is coming from a listener viewer around, is there any data or case studies on how fine art or cultural artifacts might be used for placemaking or helping with inclusion? 
are suggested by are as suggested by panelists. How would what how would one measure ROI on this investment? So I know there's been big topics about biophilia, and obviously aspects of that's been discussed, and research studies have proven from bringing the outside in, so to speak. But is there anything you could add to that about fine art and cultural artifacts to to encourage that aspect of inclusion and well-being? Yes, for sure. And I smiled really big because this is my my favorite um, topic area within within my field of work. And so the two things to say here. Um, one, on the topic of, of inclusion and well-being, um, we've been focusing a lot lately on sensory engagement. So how the brain reads the environment around us, looking at things like color, texture, proportion, pattern, form, all of those things essentially are how the physical world is readable by our brain. And each of those things come combine together to send different types of messages. As we learn more about that, those of us involved in creating places can essentially shape them to tell the stories that will be most beneficial for people to hear in certain contexts. So this has a tremendous amount of potential when it comes to creating places that feel intuitively more inclusive to a broader range of people. The next thing that I want to say about this, and this is an organization that I would recommend that you all look up, is the International Arts and Mind Lab based out of Johns Hopkins University in the United States. And they have a new initiative that they're referring to as the Neuro Arts Blueprint that they are developing in collaboration with the Aspen Institute. This is something that they are essentially launching as um, a kind of a, a new concerted field of academic study that is focused exactly on what the, the audience uh, participant was asking about. How do we measure the impact of fine art, of things that we would uh, call beautiful on the mind? Um, a lot of the early research is focused on the impact of music, um, but uh, their chart of work is targeting a broad range of ways that the brain reads uh, our, our physical world. No, thank you for that. And uh, one of your colleagues from Millenow, hello, Mark, has put the link in for that organisation for, oh, awesome. for our viewers Thanks, and listeners. Mark. So there you go. <laughs> um, I've got time for a couple of questions. Really, we could have dedicated the whole session to the Q&A, but I know we've said an hour today. Um, there was a question in from James. So thank you, James. And I think this is one big challenge, particularly in the Workplace FM role and, and probably from your client's perspective, Joseph, is about the balance between the role of tech and office design mm -hmm but also how you get that balance between your remote worker. So those individuals that are rarely seen in the office, regardless of uh, their, their working patterns, but their work or their line of work in, in, is actually them on the road or at sites. So is there any tips there from the perspective of how you get that balance right? And I think you alluded to it in some of your earlier points around that balance of tech. So is there any tips there or advice about you ensure you keep that inclusivity and inclusion, even though you may have a remote workforce? And so that's something where even with organizations that uh, describe themselves as being 100% remote, I have yet to encounter a single one that does not acknowledge the critical importance of people coming together in person at some point in time. The big question is, what cadence makes the most sense for your organization? And that's something that really only you and your organization can answer in terms of how often people need to be coming together. And there will be a variety of responses in most organizations, because as you said, there are some folks that are always on the road uh, versus folks that may be posted up at the office every single day. So this is um, really part of that dialogue that really needs to, to really start taking shape. Now, when it comes to changes in how the physical office is designed relative to the use of digital technology, one of the things that we're seeing organizations do, because a lot of this is so uncertain, is to um, implement, and this is a great example of a pilot project. If you take a very traditional conference room, um, a room that has a big rectangular table in the center with a bunch of chairs around it, and um, think about breaking that table up into a bunch of individual tables. So each seat has its own um, kind of uh, laptop table or a table for a personal device, 
Uh, there's a mobile screen for a larger uh, visual display, really taking that environment that was very fixed and static and making it much more flexible. And so this also has an interface with that idea of team level working agreements to empower folks to say, how often are we going to come together? How are we going to come together when we do? And how is that going to impact how we work? So when you take one of those very static environments, make it more mobile, make it more flexible, you give them the resources to experiment and try new things. And that means playing with, um, uh, we've heard some organizations establish a, a rule, if you will, when it comes to um, meetings that if one dials in, all dial in. So that notion that you may have five people in the office and four people on the line, but everyone is dialed into the virtual meeting platform. Everyone has a video screen, access to the chat, uploaded documents, things along those lines. But those flexible environments, those dynamic meeting spaces are an easy way to start to test some of these new dynamics of navigating that relationship between co-located and remote participants. Um, there's also been a shift in looking at the individual work point um, where if everyone's coming in to sit at their desk, to be on Zoom calls, there's a bit of a disconnect in that environment as well. Um, and so looking at um, how the physical environment responds to the way that people want to connect now and over the long term. No, thank you, Joseph. And yeah, from that point of view, definitely um, a challenge, but I think that collaboration and getting people together is key. Now I'm going to put leave this on the final question and probably people have picked up on, on our accents. Um, but where you based today and myself, but we've talked about the arts. Let's talk about culture. Um, questions in here have come really about the focus of different markets and cultures and how you overcome some of the barriers there. I know from your own personal work, it's mainly in North America. I know Miller Noel has a UK arm as well and, and across Europe. Um, but maybe this is more linked to the Asian markets where working from home culture is never going to be seen, um, particularly some of the Asian markets. So not the easiest question to leave you with, Joseph, but I guess yeah. from the perspective, how how do you overcome those markets and cultures that are instilled that some of this will never be adopted because of the culture within that market? I just wondered what would be the approach, particularly for this listener viewer that has a remit, a portfolio that is global. And I appreciate we've used the word global a few times on today's webinar. Yeah. The, the best um, suggestion that I can give here is to really focus in on those high level principles for your organization. And, you know, you may end up with three to five of these principles and you could say, oh, that's a short list. That's easy. It's not. It's very difficult to identify those high level guiding principles. But what's key here is when they're done well, they have the flexibility to be interpreted in different ways in different regions. So if you may have uh, one of the principles might be that uh, all of our staff have access to opportunity for advance and advancement or have access to information. The way that they gain access to those opportunities or information may be very different from one region to another. So it's really important to establish those and use those as a point of communication across your global workforce. And that way it allows different cultures to meet them in a way that reflects um, accurately who they are. I, I will do another plug here for um, John A. Powell, who I mentioned previously, who's with um, uh, the UC Berkeley in California. And there's a group that he's uh, started called um, the Othering and Belonging Institute. There is a, a framework or an approach that he and his group have established called targeted universalism. And this is really, this provides excellent guidance on how to establish some of those high level principles then begin to understand how different cohorts across your organization may have different relationships to those principles, and then implementing plans to allow each of them to realize those principles in a way that would be authentic. So that's an excellent resource that I would point to around doing just that, where we have different global regions that have different cultural norms um, that um, you can bring all of those folks together within an overarching vision for workplace for your organization.
No, thank you, Joseph, and pinpoint some of the resources. So what we do as part of the episode, there's a couple of links and resources Joseph's mentioned there that we will uh, cascade alongside the webinar. We've got a couple more questions, but I'm aware of time. So for the viewer listeners, I will pass these questions on to Joseph. As I said, Joseph, this section could have been a whole webinar on its own, right, as the questions come flooding through. At this point, IWFM want to thank Melanol for supporting us on uh, the guidance and checklist from the round table obviously today joseph you navigating us through that and actually done a stellar presentation of taking people through the challenges as well as the um checklists and the polls so we will feed that back but a big thank you from iwfm today for for your participation and a stellar presentation i hasten to add yes as you see on your screens there uh, members in particular that's your cpd number for today's event so i know that's key to a number of our members um, the next slide, thank you, is around community events. These are currently on our events uh, pages. These demonstrate the importance of our volunteers in the membership and the right range of uh, um, site visits right through to uh, quiz crawl. So arranging from social to more, more linked to uh, knowledge-based events. But that's the beauty of our volunteers. It's a network for peer-to-peers to, to come for challenging topics as well, social activities. So those events are on our website. And again, I just want to thank Joseph for today's presentation. He's navigated us through an excellent piece of work, that round table uh, from a number of panelists that were mentioned at the start of this. Hopefully this has given something back to you as you sit there on your screen, some of those challenges and opportunities you're probably facing and will continue to face in 2023. Um, please check out the guidance. It is available on the IWFM website and in partnership with Millenol. So massive thank you to Millenol for their support on this. Uh, today's episode will be uh, available. So the live recording will be made available shortly on our website and we will include the links to some of the extra resources that Joseph's kindly mentioned today but last but not least just to thank the listener and viewers you've taken just over an hour to to uh, join us on today's webinar i will encourage you to complete a short survey afterwards that's not just to rate today's episode but future content you would like to see out of our ntt series this is how we've built the 80 plus episodes we've done on our program since march 2020 so please fill those survey in it helps us to get the content and speakers you're looking for from a viewer listener perspective by that point, I wish you a good, good day for Joseph as he's probably uh, still in mourning over there in Buffalo. So I hope you have a lovely day, Joseph. And for our listener viewers, wherever you joined us from, I hope you have a good rest of the day and thank you again. Thanks again. Thank you very much. Thank you.